Fecal microbial transplantation is an age-old technique described as early as the 4th century AD in literature. The widespread occurrence of C. difficile and its increasing resistance to existing antibiotics have necessitated the need for alternative treatments. Recently, this therapy has gained popularity because it's perceived as being more natural. Many centers do not perform this procedure owing to the lack of specific guidelines outlining the process. Therefore, in this educational video, we describe the entire process in a simple step-by-step -step fashion as performed in our institution. Indications for treatment pertain to three groups of patients, those with recurrent or relapsing CDC, as defined as greater than three episodes of mild to moderate CDC with failure to respond to a six to eight week tapering vancomycin course with or without alternative antibiotics such as metronidazole, nifaximin, or fidaximin, or at least two episodes of CDC resulting in hospitalization and significant mortality. The second group are those with moderate CDC with no response to standard therapy vancomycin or fidaxomycin for at least one week. And the last group are those with severe or fulminating CDC. The most important limiting factor of the process is the donor stool collection, owing to the paucity of stool banks and the unusual nature of the transplantation. The donor can be either an intimate family member or an unrelated healthy volunteer. Since fecal microbial transplantation does carry a potential risk for transmission of infectious agents, rigorous testing is routinely recommended. These minimal tests should be done within four weeks of the donation. The stool tests that are usually done include looking for Clostridium difficile toxin B, ova and parasite examinations, and routine culture for enteric pathogens. Serologic tests include hepatitis A, IgM, hepatitis B surface antigen, antibodies to hepatitis C, RPR, HIV-1, and two enzyme immunoassay. Varying routes of administration are available. Number one, NG or N nasoenteric tube. Number two, upper endoscopy with duodenal infusion. Number three, colonoscopy. Four, flexible sigmoidoscopy. Five, enema. Here we are opening a Ziploc bag delivered by the donor. Inside is a sealable plastic container that has the actual stool specimen. The donor has sterilized this container at home with alcohol prior to its use. The equipment needed includes a dedicated blender. A simple kitchen blender will do. At this step, we're removing the donor stool that is still sealed in the container. We have normal saline which will be used as a diluent. Make sure that it has no added antimicrobial agents. We have spatula that are used in stirring. Some institutions use coffee filters as a final straining. We use colanders for filtering. One coarse colander and one that is a finer mesh. Here are 10 syringes that will be used to collect the final specimen. We are opening the donor stool container. Between 50 and 60 grams of stool have been recommended to be mixed with 300 cc's of normal saline. In our institution, we traditionally use larger amounts than this. In this case, we are mixing the stool with a liter of normal saline because we plan to divide this donor specimen into three different fecal transplants on this particular day. Here we begin pouring saline into the blender in preparation for emulsifying the stool. At other institutions, water and even milk has been used as diluents.
The emulsified stool is then removed from the blender and poured through the first colander. This is the coarse colander, which removes large particulate matter that could cause obstruction in the channel of the endoscope. At this stage, we begin the second filtering process using a smaller meshed colander, which is a finer sieve. The liquid is poured through and the spatula can again be used to help remove the liquid. At this point, coffee filters can also be used if finer filtration is needed. The final product should appear as a blenderized liquid solution. And this brown liquid has been shown to be very rich in gut microbes. The filtered donor solution is now being drawn up into individual 60 cc syringes to be used in the fecal microbial transplant. We typically use one syringe of 60 cc's for duodenal infusion, either via the upper endoscope or a nasoduodenal tube. For colonoscopic installation, we use 10 60 cc syringes. 400 cc's are placed in the terminal ileum and 600 cc's into the right colon. The filtration process is now complete and the donor specimen can be moved from the preparation area to the endoscopy suite. This first patient is having an installation into the proximal small bowel via a pediatric colonoscope. At this point, the endoscope is advanced well past the stomach. Here we are in the jejunum and we take a 60 cc syringe with the donated filtered fecal material and instill it. After installation, the procedure should be quickly terminated, pausing only to remove excess air from the stomach to avoid the risk of nausea, vomiting, and aspiration. Here we are doing the second case where the specimen is being instilled via the colonoscope. Colonoscopy is proceeded to the point where we have reached the right colon. The patient is placed in the right side down position so any fluid instilled will stay on the right side of the colon. The IC valve is entered and the first 400 cc's is placed in the terminal ileum. Here we are completing the installation of the fluid into the terminal ileum. The endoscope is withdrawn quickly into the cecum. Here is a view of the cecum containing the fluid. The patient is still in the right side down position After installation, the procedure should be terminated rather quickly. We try to remove the instrument very quickly to avoid suctioning any of the fluid or displacing it to the left side of the colon. All examination of the colon, including biopsy, should have been done on insertion. Therefore, this is not always a very good screening colonoscopy. Adverse events may occur, including gastrointestinal symptoms such as bloating, flatulence, nausea, abdominal pain and or cramps, and diarrhea. These are usually mild and self-limiting. Aspiration due to duodenal installation and sedation at the time of colonoscopy. Possible flare-up of transient fever in patients with underlying IBD. 
In summary, FMT is a simple and effective treatment for patients with recurrent CDC. The idea of altering intestinal microbiome is a novel concept and establishing standardized protocols will go a long way in making the therapy more accessible to the masses. However, there are still unanswered questions regarding the long-term effects and potential transmission of infectious agents and diseases that are caused by gut microbial changes. Moving forward, further studies are required to improve our understanding of this complex mechanism.